Welcome to More Geeks and Gay. This is Edward. And I apologize. We've been a little tardy lately. Tardy. We've been absent. But there's been reasons. There's been basically just time and also little glitches here and there. Hi, Screech. So we are getting back on schedule. The other two podcasts have like suffered just as much as this one, if not a little bit more. So... Let's just get straight into this. Yay! Welcome! There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. Tiny white. I'm like, okay, is he ready yet? Hello, it's been a while <laughs> for more ways and reasons than one. Welcome to More Geek Than Gay. I'm Joseph. Hi, I'm Edward. Um, we were on a little hiatus there for Sabbatical a bit. Yes. Or something. Yeah, just because... Life. Tired. <laughs> it took me a week to get con to um, recover from San Diego, which I'll tell you all about. Um, I have to, I wrote it down and I got stuff. I got stuff, got but anyways, stuff. we'll go on that in a little bit. First off, how have you been? Busy at work. Busy at work, busy with trying to find a graduate school, and busy with writing. Matter of fact, I am kind of at work even as we speak. Yes, he's on call this weekend. I am. I am being paid for this weekend whether I work or not. Well, that's good. Yeah. But we have a client that... Uh, there's a reason why I keep on checking is because we have a client that has threatened to send in edits over the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they can. Because they can. And that means that two of us get to be disturbed because I have to take care of one part of it and someone else has to take another part of it. Because it's, it's a complicated coding thing. Oh. Yeah. And I don't, I don't do the other part of the coding, so I, I can just handle the edits part. I can't handle the coding of the edits. So, yeah, that's a gun I keep on checking. Okay. Yeah. That's a gun I'm also glad that that other one was like, oh, if she wants to work this weekend, that's not me. I'll, I'll be calling someone else to come in and <laughs> work that because I don't know that system either. <laughs> and none of that is me. So, woohoo! Yay! Yay! Ta da! <laughs> um, so, this is going to be basically nothing but Comic Con. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, I mean, you want to you want to like cover little things before we get to Comic Con? Okay, sure. What do we want to cover? Well, first of all, I have been working on um, possibly finding even a, another new way of doing the podcast recording. Oh. Yes, so that we can hopefully get get Miss Karen back in here or do interviews with people more easily. Yes. I was looking at Skype and. Oh, you're talking. Oh, that's why you're asking about Skype. Right? That's why I was asking about Skype. I was looking into Skype, but Skype really would only work from the laptop, not so much from the the pad. pad. And the laptop doesn't record sound as well as the pad does. Yeah. Well, yeah, because so, you watch the first episode, you'll understand. Yeah. Or listen to the first episode. Yeah, where I had to actually use a mixing board as compared to these. Or yeah, but it was off the laptop too. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's a come. I'm I'm looking at another program. We're gonna we're gonna like maybe see about loading it to your 
pad also and see if I can call you and see how that works. Okay. Yeah, so that way we can, like, maybe interview Miss Marcy. Oh, I was planning on hitting her up next weekend. Okay. By the way, Marcy. <laughs> Guess what? I was planning on hitting you up next weekend, but we'll go into that later. <laughs> or we get Karen back in? Yes. I miss Karen. I miss Karen having Karen in also. We'll have to figure out where well, she's I miss Karen in general, but well, uh, yeah. yeah. We'll have to figure out where she falls on the screen because it does like this split screeny type thing or whatever, but so I don't we'll know see. exactly how that works. Yeah, yeah, well that's what we'll have to play with, is figuring yeah. out how it works. Hi Screech. Yeah, Screech is here. Yes. Hi, Lurky Screech. was here, but he ran away and Garfield is asleep. Oh, wait, no, he just opened his eyes because I mentioned his name. Hi, Garfield. Okay, whatever. Yeah. So, um... What else I got? What else I got? Well, we did go see a movie. We've seen two movies, I believe, since the last time we recorded. Well, I know... Yes, we have seen two movies. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. We saw two, two movies. Relevant to the podcast yes. movies. Yes, we have. Yeah, we're later than everybody else in seeing these two movies, but Actually, we no, have seen them. the other one was not late. It was a week after, two weeks after. Yeah, no, a, one seen, week. Everybody had seen it. Not everybody, but yes. Every, one was the interwebs and everything. Yeah, one, one, one of them we were one week behind, and the other one we were two months behind. Yeah, one of them, and the one that where you're saying we were only like a week behind, actually, it had premiered like the Wednesday prior. Well, yeah, that, so that, it's like they do that now. So yeah, it's like a week and a half, and by then everybody had seen it, except for us. Except for us. Yeah. So, anyways, what did we see? Well, let's start with the old one first. We saw Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Yes. Dawn, go away, I'm no good for you. No, that wasn't in the movie. Should have been. So, what'd you think? I liked it. I thought the CGI was better. That was that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big thing. Um, I... I actually just really liked it. I thought it did well, and it clearly is leading up to another one, probably like War of the Planet of the Apes or something like that. They can't do Paddle of the Planet of the Apes because that was already used. Yes. Yeah. So it's clearly leading up to a third movie. Um, it's one of those movies, fortunately not as bad as many other movies, but it's one of those movies that really does rely upon... A couple people doing just like stupid things to in order for the plot to work. Well, yeah, but that's usually the case in and general in, this, in life in general. And in this case, I'm I'm halfway willing to excuse it be, for two reasons. One, it wasn't all over the place, and two, the it's it's stupid things on behalf of humans, and the humans had pretty much. You know, we don't know what their what their training had been or whatever, so we don't know if they had been, if we should expect them to have level-headed, logical responses to things. Yeah. As compared to Prometheus, where those were trained scientists, and there was no excuse for pretty much anything they did in the whole movie. So, there, I'm, I'm able to give this one much more leeway. Well, look in at the you, bringing up, a, bringing up an older year-plus movie. To compare. Well, Prometheus is a really great example of a movie where those scientists made decisions that scientists would never have made. Okay, and there wasn't a good scientist amongst them, to be totally honest. It, 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 it's, it was a, that's the big problem I have with Prometheus. It wasn't the other stuff, it was just the, it, just one bad decision after another that was unbelievably bad. So, that's how come here, it's a bad decision, but we don't know that they had training to th make good decisions. Well, they were based on military it. style. They were military style, but a lot of them were civilians. So, while they were kind of running military style, we don't know that they had any military style training, or if they just incorporated military style it, because, of after of the, because of the plague. Right, and therefore it's easier to set up rank and know who to follow and all that. So, yeah, I'm very willing to cut a lot of leeway with stupid decisions in that case. But other than that, I really liked it. There was actually some moving parts. There was some moving parts like a, like a real boy. And... There was a nice little moment that threw back to the first movie. 
I don't think you needed to see the first movie, but it did give you a little extra something if you had seen the first movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What did you think? I liked it. I really liked it. It was a good one. I liked it better than the first movie. First movie I thought was good, don't get me wrong, but, you know. I was I, pleasantly I thought, surprised by yeah. the first one, too. But this one was better. It was more, and probably because, you know, the first movie was just introducing this new lore to, you know, to the Planet of the Apes canon. Um, but this one, this, the, the Dawn or Rise, which one? This Dawn. was Dawn. Dawn. No, Rise. No, Dawn. 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 Um, this one was good. I liked it because of the fact that, you know, they, they, they continued it on. Yeah. And, and, um... Well, which they so, did with the first five movies, too. They continued it on. Yeah, but at the same time. A, but, they're, but towards the but the last two or three, when they, you know, all of a sudden it's like, no, Earth is really there. And it's, you know, humans and apes and the whole weird societal thing. Are we going back to the original movies? Yeah. yeah the original like, movies, yeah. There's a whole time travel thing that goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, was a, you know, it didn't like it. And for a brief moment, I thought they were actually going to do an homage to the second movie, um, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. I believe that's the second movie. I was really waiting for there to be a giant nuclear missile. Oh, that they all worked yeah. up to? <laughs> yeah, they're, I mean, and you know what scene I'm talking about. Yeah, where yeah, yeah. They were go I'm like going... Is there going to be a nuclear missile? Is this? Are we going to find apes that are already here? Hmm. So, but they didn't really throw back to the other movies, which in the very in the first movie they did do a throwback to yeah. the original five movies. Yeah, but no, they did do something like, yeah, because it was when they were some of the apes were on the horses. Well, yeah, I was like, oh, cool. They already started doing the horse thing. Which was from the original stuff. Right, but I mean, they didn't do anything plot-wise that really... No, no, but they did a lot of foreshadow foreshadowing. Like, in the first movie, they mention the um, space flight that is in the original Planet of the Apes movies. Yeah. And it's it's mentioned and Forgotten, but it sets it to where, oh, this maybe is the beginning of... of yeah. Those other movies, they may be all still the exact same universe, which really doesn't work because of the time tra travel thing. And yeah, but hey, you have to disregard a couple movies. But we do that with the Superman movies too. So, well, we disregard and the, and the Spider Man movies too. We, yeah, well, you know, I haven't seen the Amazing Spider Man movies one way or the other to feel one way about disregarding those. But well, yeah. The girlfriend alone dictates that you have to disregard the other ones. I've never been a Gwen Stacy fan. I'm just saying. I'm just never saying. been a Gwen Stacy. So fan. what's the second movie that the we saw? The second that movie was, that we that saw that was only a week and a half old. Um. Well, I am Groot. I am Groot. Okay, we saw I am Groot. I am Groot. I am Groot. I'm yes. Groot. And what'd you think of I am Groot? I am Groot. I am Groot. <laughs> Groot. I'm Groot. He liked it. I'm Groot. <laughs> oh my god, my legs are transparently white. Yes, they are. Or, oh, I am Groot. I am Groot. <laughs> I am Groot. I am Groot. <laughs> oh, you totally messed that up now. Oh, I am Groot. <laughs> good movie. We saw Guardians of the Galaxy. Very good movie. Um, I enjoyed it. It was interesting because I we had seen I am this. Groot. We well, we saw both of these movies after I got back from Comic Con, but there was nothing about um, the Planet of the Apes there. Uh, but there was still a lot of stuff from Guardians of the Galaxy because it was just about to open up, or opened up. I don't remember. It, my weeks have been totally off, so it was good. I liked it. Um, I'm trying to think of there was. You're changing your shirt. Why are you changing your shirt? I am changing my shirt. shirt. I am not liking how this shirt is looking. You just keep talking. <laughs> okay. I am Groot. I am, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you keep being on Groot. You keep being Groot. But it was it was a good movie. I liked it. Um, Chris Pratt uh, was a very good actor. Actually, everybody I thought was good. I didn't have uh, any problems. Oh, there he comes. Now he... You can't say anything, but I am Groot, though. I actually liked um, The Damn Raccoon. But and I was I not a fan of his 
all before that. I am Groot. <laughs> before that, I'm like, every time they showed any kind of preview, mm -hmm. any time, I didn't even care for him in the cartoon to the comics. I am Groot. Okay, so you're, you're familiar <laughs> with him from the comic books? Because he's so obscure. We already so had this obscure. discussion, yes. He's such we an had obscure this, character. We had this discussion already, yes. You were, don't, you don't forget, I did grow up with parents who read co comics. And even then, he's an obscure character. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's he, he, he's obscure. In the movie, you actually, they did a little, you know, uh, storyline of, you know, how he became and stuff. And you, and you, made, you made him go, aww. Yeah. And um, there were some nice cameos. Oh, I didn't care for Gamora. I thought that I didn't care for Gamora. I the actress. I didn't believe in most scenes that she was in. No, really. Especially when it. she was. Especially when she was talking. I, I know that sounds funny, but she has action moments, and the action. It's not that I didn't believe her action scenes. Okay, I. It's when she was actually talking and interacting with people on a conversational level, is when I found her, for the most part, completely unbelievable. I didn't get that at all. I, I actually thought that the wrestler dude was a better actor than her. Dave Batista. 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 David Batista. And I am Groot. Um, mm -hmm. And I also did not care for... Ah, uh, oh, and I knew his name earlier today. Chris the, Pratt. No, the guy from Walking Dead. Oh, Michael Rooker. Yeah, his character's name I cannot think of for the life of me right now. Uh, and I should be yeah. able to think of it. Oh, I can't look it up because we're recording on that device. Um, <laughs> but he's actually... That character is from the original Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay. Um, that, that's a comic book idea that goes back to the 70s. And they they were set in the future, and he was a warrior with a bow and arrow. They incorporate they did a nice thing with incorporating like the magic arrow with it or whatever. But I did not. Uh, 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 Yondu, Yondu, yeah, Yondu, Yondu, yes, Yondu. I did not care for the character that they did, and I. It makes me. It actually made me question the actor, whether the actor is able to play anything other than that exact same character that I've seen him play on Walking Dead. Because it seemed exactly the same character. Which makes me wonder if he's ever actually acting or if he just goes on there and just says lines. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Stan Lee had his cameo in it. Typically he only is in movies where he is part of the creation of it. That's why he wasn't in the Ghost Rider movies. And for a while this confused me, but he was creator... He and Jack Kirby created Groot, which I believe predates the Fantastic Four. It's back when Marvel hadn't started doing superheroes yet. They were still doing just basically monster comics and romance comics. Yeah. So, and... And Lloyd Kaufman from Troma Movies was in it, and I thought that was him. Who was he? He was in the prison when they were all yelling at Gamera. Remember all the prisoners yelling at Gamera? Yeah. yeah. Whereas they were walking in. There's a moment when, you know, and they show different sets of prisoners yelling and screaming horrible things to, him, to her. And he was in one of the shots where they showed prisoners yelling things to her. At her. What? And I went, Lloyd Kaufman's oh. in it? Really? Then I, I, but I didn't want to say anything during the movie. Because I don't do that. Yeah, and plus, I don't know if Lloyd Kaufman would mean anything to you. But, interesting enough, Lloyd Kaufman is actually buddies with Stan Lee. They had talked for a long time, apparently early on in their careers, about working together on doing movies and stuff. He's not listed here. His, it was just a weird cameo thing. Um, is What's his face listed? How do you spell his last name? Uh, with a K. K-A-U-F. Yeah, there he thing. is. Okay. Prisoner, He's a prisoner. Uncredited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just like, um, what's his did face? Did you know Seth Green was the voice of Howard the Duck? Yes, I did. I did not know that. And, and then what's his face from Firefly? 
help me out here. I can't think of his name to save my life. Josh Brolin was Thanos. Yes. That's not you helping me out with the name of the guy from Firefly. I have no idea who. Oh, you? um, and Rob Zombie was the the voice, voice of, of the computer of the navigator. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Which I don't remember that voice being on there, but that's still not helping me think of the name of the actor. Nathan Fillion. Nathan Fillion was in it. Yeah, Although he was a un- voice. Completely unidentifiable. He was, he was a voice. That's all he was. He was monstrous inmate voice. Well, because it's the mo- he's the voice of the monstrous inmate. He's that blue one that gets picked up by its nose. Okay. Yeah. So, ta-da! All sorts of weird little cameos for you to look for. And for, now, the, for what, the three people who have yet to see the movie? Yeah. And now we have four... I believe, of the Infinity Stones revealed between all the movies. There's six stones. In the Thor movie, you get to see the Infinity Gauntlet. And that's what Thanos is working on getting, is the six stones to put together in the Infinity Gauntlet, which would control everything. All space, all time, all everything. Oh, very Lord of the Rings. And that's probably what they're going to be doing for the third Avengers movie. Some people are thinking that Howard the Duck appearing at the end of the movie will... Oh, spoiler alert. Yeah. Welcome to the interwebs. Um, (laughs) No plot spoilage here. This is actually just a... If you... I, you if know, you stick around through the whole And I'm still surprised that people do not stick around for a Marvel movie... Credits, because Marvel, the Marvel movies are known for these tags at the end. They are. And the, you, like... Over half of the people in the in the theater got up and left. Yeah, yeah. I was like, do you not... You know, this is like, what, Marvel movie number 18 or something? Yeah. See, and this is one of those spoilers that I don't feel badly about at all. Because I'm not spoiling anything about how the movie goes or anything like this. This has nothing to do... It's, it's kind of like finding out, oh, the Avengers went out to go eat shawarma. Okay. It's one of those tags. They did? They did. Where? At the end of the Avengers movie. The first one? Yes. I don't remember that. They went to go eat shawarma. I don't remember that. Well, was I awake? We actually might have gotten up and left. (laughs) No, you weren't with me when I saw the Avengers. Well, then I don't know why you didn't know that. I remember I saw the midnight showing of it, so that's why I'm like, was I awake? Because that's when um, Malon and I went to the... Oh, actually, that scene was added after the preview. Oh, see, so that's why I didn't it see was, it. It was a, it, it was, was an, an added, added scene. From, from what I remember, it was an added scene. Because, yeah, because we saw it was pretty yeah. good. So, yeah, so this is just one of those little flavor scenes. It's not a, ooh, here's a tidbit of information that's going to lead to the next movies. Even though some people are making a big deal out of Howard the Duck being there, that, ooh, they're going to do another Howard the Duck movie. No, we've had a Howard the Duck movie. And whether you love, hate, indifferent, whatever about the Howard the Duck movie... If you're familiar with Howard the Duck in comic books, look into your heart and be truthful. We got the best Howard the Duck movie we could get. There is no way to translate Howard the Duck into a better movie. He doesn't have any major storylines. People complained about how like disagreeable and unpleasant he was. He was downright friendly in the movie compared to him in the book. I mean in the comic books. He gets it on with a human female all the time, so there's your whole bestiality squick that people got all up in arms over. And the best you can do is, like, baby, bring out Dr. Bong, which isn't that type of bong, by the way. So, no, you're not going to get a better Howard the Duck movie. Live for the Howard the Duck that you got. That's as good as it's going to get. But we may get a better Man-Thing movie. There was a Howard, Man Thing? No, but Howard the Duck say, links in with Man Thing. Yeah, Howard the Duck was in the first Man Thing movie. Oh, there was a Man Thing movie. I don't remember that. It was going to be a theatrical release, oh. and they pulled it at the last minute. There had even been trailers in the theaters, and they pulled it at the last minute, and it ended up being aired on Sci Fi Channel. If you ever want to see a, a big, dark mess of disappointment, uh, I have it on DVD. 
Oh, see, I never saw it, so that's why. The The big problem with it is they did an okay job of the design. It's just they introduced a whole bunch of mythology that didn't need to be there. And he's on the screen for maybe all of ten minutes for the whole movie. So, yeah. I would love to see a better Man-Thing movie. But... I'm I'm very psyched about the Ant Man movie coming out. I'm very psyched about the Doctor Strange movie, which will bring out the magic element of the Marvel universe. So those are things that I'm looking forward to. And they've already greenlit a second Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Oh yeah. Which I wouldn't be surprised if they do a second Guardians of the Galaxy movie that ends up tying into the third Avengers, Avengers. movie. And basically teams up the Guardians of the Galaxy with the Avengers, because if you're going to go Thanos with the Infinity Gauntlet, it took the totality of the Marvel Universe to bring down Thanos. It was not an Avenger storyline. It was a, hey, I hey, think this person appeared in one issue of something somewhere. Make sure they're in there. Yeah. And he starts out by killing half of the universe anyway. Well, you can tell by just... just Without, a, and I mean, there's no conflict. He just, half of the universe ceases to exist. Living-wise. So, yeah, they, they're going to have to bring in pretty much everything for the Thanos movie in 3. But I'm really looking forward to the Ultron movie. Everyone's like thinking, it's just a robot. And Ultron is actually possibly the most pervasively evil moment for the Avengers ever. So I'm I'm very pleased about that idea. But we went to some movies. Yes. Surprisingly, we went to the movies. We went to the movies. We actually lay, laid down at the movies. Yeah, it's one of those, you know... That was for Rise of the Planet of the Apes. You know, where it was one of those that the chairs like leaned back like a lazy boy. One of, it was a dine-in one, but we got there so late we didn't dine in. Yeah. Um, but it was nice. You know, hey, there's there's... We saw four movies this summer. That's actually one more than usual. Hey, hey. We don't go to the movies. Well, Edward doesn't really go to the movies. I used to go to the movies all the time. Not anymore. So, I... I th so, that basically... I think that catches us up on that stuff for right now. I'm, <laughs> you're looking at something. What are you looking I'm at? I'm trying to figure out if there's anything. I, I'm looking for cues anywhere nearby of okay. like what else I might have wanted to talk about. And I can't think of anything right now. All right. Well, let's talk about... Cop um, yeah. let's, See, let's talk. doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Lurky it did. Um, <laughs> San Diego Comic Con. All right. Yes, the, this is basically, what, two and a half weeks late? Yep. Uh, I didn't go. No, he can't go. I can't go. He can't go, ever. I had to work. He has to work. And technically I was working too. But uh, it was Jeannie Koch, T. L., um, Terry L. Smith. You yes, that down. yes, you're going to put this down and I'm putting it over here. Um, and myself, we drove from Phoenix, Arizona to San Diego. We left on Tuesday, the twenty July 22nd, and come back on Tuesday, July 29th. So, it was a nice, it was a great time. I ain't going to say it. It was more than nice. It was a great time. I was so tired. So, let's go and start off with this. I'm basically reading what Jeannie wrote because I forgot to write everything down. So, the first day of San Diego Con, uh, which was Wednesday. Was great. Was great. We had lunch with our friends Brian and Michelle, Marianne, Antonio, Casey, Jeff, Jeffrey, Terry, and myself, and Jeannie, uh, over at Toscana. Toscana is a great uh, restaurant, it's an Italian place. It's a smallish kind of a place, but they love us, we love them. Get used to that name, you're going to yes. hear it a couple times during Toscana. this. Time. I mean, it, we got there, lunch started about 1, and we left there about 5.30. Um, Should just call it, give it like a nickname, Toto's. No. But not once did they ever try to force us out. Not once did they say, you know, are you ready for your bill? You guys are geeks, get out of here. They, we eat, we ate, we drank, we ate, we drank, we drank. Of course you drank. We you were with authors. Yeah. But not all of them are authors. At least two of them. 
Well, let's see. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, well, I mean, the, uh, that's a truthful statement. At least two of them. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we had, that was also Wednesday. It was registration day and preview night. So I got my badge. And, you know, here we go with the, you know, I'm showing off things that for people who are listening won't be able to see. But I got my badge. See, there's my badge. It says professional. It has my name Four on day. it. Four days. 2014. This was the lanyard that it came on. Which is red. Which is red. Says and it says penny show, show times Penny Dreadful. Um, but I changed the lanyard. We're going to do it another time. Um, Marianne is our Lego woman. She's a professional Lego builder. Who do? And every time we see her, she lives in, um, in San Diego County. And every time she sees, we see her, she always gives us something. Hey, speaking of people who need to give us something, and who knew? Hey, if there's any professional petty four makers, you know, like hook how us they have, up. You know, like the the cupcake people. Yeah, but but petty fours, so I can be a dainty giant. I love petty fours. Okay, so, continue. This time around, for those of you watching. Um, who cannot see, I'm sorry, she does keychains on her website. So, this is K9! We, I got a K9 keychain. And you got a TARDIS before this. And last year I got a TARDIS. And you got an airplane. And then when we saw her uh, in January, I got um, an airplane. And then when I saw her at the, um, in May at the book signing, I got a ghost from... You know, the ghost from Pac-Man, the video games? Ah. I, I got ghosts. I don't remember seeing the ghosts. I gave that to my mom. Oh, well, that's why. For some reason, I, I was, like, remembering an owl. Oh, yeah, I got an owl, too. Oh, I gave the owl, too. Okay. I gave the owl to somebody. Oh, wait, the ghost came for... Wait, I got the ghost in January because I gave that to my mom for her birthday. The owl I got in May. Um, and I don't know who I gave the that one to. I can't recall. I think I might have given it to Jessica. My sister. I don't know her for sure. But anyways, so we got to see them and hang out over at Toscana. Um, everyone, uh, you know, like I said, it was also preview day, but I did not go to preview day because I actually went out with my friends Scott and Will. We went out to dinner instead. I told Scott that he could have me for dinner on Wednesday and Friday nights. So that was that was there. Um, like and I said, it was registration day. By the way, his new lanyard is, is all will come kind out of later. pretty. Oh, it will. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then that I happened on anything. Friday. Okay. Then, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's all in order, honey. Fine. Go back to go back to your okay. reading. Second day, which was um, Thursday. Oh, the... You read everything for the, and we got more books. You talked about Did you talk about the party? No, that's that's Thursday. That's not oh, the that's second Thursday? day. Oh, yeah. that's second day. Oh, okay. Second day, which is. I thought you were still on the first day. No, no, no. I thought that was still the no, first day was... paragraph. No. Okay. Sorry. No problem. He's reading it over my shoulders. It's a good thing I don't Oh, yeah. Him. There's different names. I know him. Yeah. Cool. Well, I met him. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking Ed. about. Ed. Or Black. Oh, okay. Um, so, anyways, um, Thursday, uh, which was the first full day of uh, San Diego Comic Con, uh, we hung out. Jeannie and I, we were with Marianne and, and Terry. And just, you know, we went to different panels. We walked around. We went to a world building panel um, that had Nancy Holder, Nathan Long, Ed Erdlack. Erdlack. See? <laughs> Robert <laughs> Roach and Jeffrey Tuig. Point was me, I have no idea why. I know, exactly. And then we got to see our friend um, Blanca Christian, so it was good to see her. We also went Blanca, to. Not Blanca? You know it's Blanca because oh, okay. it's, she's from um, San Salvador, El Salvador, and oh, apparently down there they say Blanca, not Blanca. That's weird. Because they're still Spanish down there. Yeah, well, apparently that's what they say. Okay. So all this time I've been calling her Blanca, Blanca. It's been I've been mis mispronouncing her name. Sorry. Sorry, did Blanca. Did not hear that. So, anyways, um, did that. Uh, we went to, Jeannie and I also went to the Roddenberry um, Productions panel, which, you know, and she won a book, uh, and she got it signed, and then we saw the end of the series or not panel, and that was with um, Jonathan May Mayberry, 
This is Thursday, right? This is still Thursday. Okay. And I was moderated by Mary Elizabeth, who is from uh, Mysterious Galaxy. She's one of the owners of Mysterious Galaxy in, okay. in San Diego. Whoops. And Jonathan Mayberry is the um, going to be the writer in the X-Files anthology coming up. He's going to be one of many, right? Because uh, it's an I anthology. Think it's, no, I didn't say writer. Editor. You said writer. I thought I said editor. He's editing too. Oh, okay. So, and it was he's a very nice man as well. Um, and then let's see what did we do? So we did that, did that. I didn't get anything that day. No, I didn't get it. That was not the day Wait, I got. Didn't stuff. you get that? That's that night. So. Oh, sorry. As compared to that day, it's that night. Yeah, 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 yeah. My bad. So. Um, Jeannie had her world building panel at seven to eight. Um, we were, um, we went to that night from seven to eleven was the penguin penguin random house um, author party. You wanted to say pilgrim? Yes, I know. Okay. And so we were late. We got there about at eight thirty ish. So there we went. You know, we saw Lee from Phoenix Comic Con. We saw um, David. Uh, Marriott and Elizabeth Hart, Mary Elizabeth Hart, because you know they were there with Mysterious Galaxy. Um, it was it was really fun. Oh my gosh, it was so fun. The drinks were free, the food was free. They had a, they had a photo booth, you know, that you get at like a state fair. You know, the things that you you know the three pictures, three or four. Yes, those pictures. So, um, that for centerpieces, they had just a group of three or four books. Centerpieces, just lying centerpieces. there. Not know? flowers. Books. Not flowers. Yeah, books. Well, it's a book part, you know. Yeah. Publishers. Oh my God, I would be so picking up everything that wasn't nailed down. Yeah, well, I was reading a book and I was looking at it, and this guy starts talking to me, and it turns out it, his name is Peter Kleins, and he writes um, the X heroes, X heroes, the heroes, or X heroes. Um, and I was reading the back of it, and he was talking to me about it, and. He actually signed the book. See, and here, here's... And this turns out to be book four, so I have to find the rest of them. And there you go. For those of you who are listening, you're missing out. Pity. So... <laughs> he, he showed a book I cover. showed a book cover, okay? So that's what you missed if you were just listening. Oh, fine. Here. There you go. Here's the signature. Down. Now, and, there. And there he showed a signature. From the author. From so, the author. Remember, these are... Theater of the Mind. It, there you go. These are um, centerpieces. See, it's not that hard. The listeners are good. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, these are centerpieces. So, when we were leaving the party, um, there was a table that you walked out. And that you that They had 25 books at this table. And you got a list of all 25. And you get to pick five books that you want to be mailed to you at a later date. Um, and then you also got a uh, a bag of about mm, about eight to ten books that you you know that your swag bag for coming thank you to coming to the party and um, oh hold on uh, anyway so I'll finish this story and so the woman at the table she's like well you're not supposed to take those as are um, those books are just for um, show they're not supposed to be given a wow or anything like this and I said I know I'm sorry but I talked to the author about his book and he signed it to me so it's mine now isn't it and she's like yeah we really can't do anything with a signed book when it's signed to a person so yay me I got a free book so I'm gonna get and so I actually got like about maybe 18 books <laughs> so that was a good had a good time at that party um, Met a couple, met met a few people. Food was good. Drinks were drinks were sw strong. Uh, Jeannie and I did the. You got hit on like four times. Three times. Three times. Sorry, sorry. Well, I gave you credit for one more. Well, it was four. <laughs> it was three guys, four different times. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I got cruised on. And one of them, I might, you know, hey, you who? So that was Thursday. So third day of San Diego Comic Con, which is Friday. Um, we had uh, Jeannie had a photo shoot that morning ish for um, 
for her uh, alumni. She went to uh, Mount St. Mary's in Los Angeles, and they she is going to be featured in an article with a in their magazine and have a and so the these photos were for that, and it was fun. I had a good time, you know, basically you know just watching them do that stuff and see the photographer put Jeannie in bizarre weird poses that look totally natural on camera. You know how that goes. Oh yeah. So after that, we went over, and, and that's how come you guys couldn't go to any panels that morning. Yes, yeah, Such that, as that the death of romance comics or the milestone comics one. Yeah, that that was basically was that, that took that. about two and a half hours, two two and a half hours for that photo shoot, if not a little longer. Milestone comics turned twenty one. Yay! So, um, right right before we went to Comic Con, um, Kenny Kenny came over. He was, he is, um, the daughter's boyfriend, and he came over. I'm taking this away from you, too. So he, he was coming and staying the weekend with us. Um, San Diego, we got him a ticket and stuff. And so we did that. Oh, we went to, um, I'm going to say his name wrong. John's, uh... Barrowman. No. Picasso. No, Picasso. It looks like it says Picasso. That name, I'm going to say his name wrong. I'm going to say his name. Looking here, it looks like Picasso. Yeah, well, it. anyways, it's John... Picasso? Yeah. <laughs> like Picasso, except for a CEO. Picasso. Yeah. He was a guest of honor artist. Uh, he won the Hugo Award, and he's recreating um, the Mexican tarot cards and going to be cre uh, doing a game, mm -hmm. a card game with them. And you got a, a card of one of his drawings or paintings signed. Yes. And it's a robot with an umbrella. And what's they the don't name want of to rust. El, Para, El Paraguas. That's her, that's her name. I think that's the name for an umbrella. I don't remember. Well, that exactly. probably, yeah, but see that he updated them. So probably the original is the umbrella, but he updated it with the Tav Sci-Fi. Oh, okay. Because all of them he's updated. Oh, this it. is going to be one of the cards? Yeah, that's one of the cards. Ew. Yeah, I think an umbrella is one of the cards in that. Yeah. Yeah. So he, we went over to his um, booth and he signed it. It's really cool. Look, 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 look. There it is. See, you can't see it if you're listening. It's so There's robot color. with an umbrella. There's the color. There's the black and white. A black and white robot with an umbrella. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's raining. In the rain. In the rain. You have to make sure that you say in the rain. Yes. And so we did that. Um, we walked around um, and did a lot of stuff. Uh, Kenny uh, did the signed up, signed up for the blood drive. So he, we, you know, we went to the blood drive and walked him over to the blood drive. That's actually and, Coke. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so we did that, and then um, then Veronica, um, Jeannie's daughter, came. Um, Scott dropped her off when he picked me up around, I think it was like 6 in the afternoon, because it was Friday, it was Friday night, and I told Scott that I would be with him on Friday, so we basically exchanged people. Okay. And Scott and I went out to dinner, and they went out to dinner, and guess where they went out to dinner? Toscana! Yes, they went to the, the dinner at Toscana, which, you know, hey, that's fine, because, you know, Toscana is really good. Um... <laughs> Let's see. Hold on. My earring fell off. Ah! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Your earring's almost as big as your head. I know. I'm breaking in these earrings. So, we did that. Uh, then we have... Then it's Saturday. Saturday of San Diego Comic Con. Saturday. Um, in the con. I think it was San Diego. Uh, Veronica... And Kenny, they basically took off for the day. Okay. They waited in line for Hall H. <laughs> Four hours. Four hours to get into Hall H. Now, Four hour. So that Hall H is the one that everybody hears about. Hall H or why they go to Ballroom Twenty or Ballroom Six A B C. Or ACF or whatever, one of those, I can't remember. What was it that they were wanting to go see in Hollywood? They H? wanted to go see Arrow. Oh, okay. Twang. Four hours. 
to get in. Kenny dressed up as Wolverine, and Veronica dressed up oh. as Black Canary. <gasps> so they they dressed up. Um, did she wear a mask? Yes, she did wear the mask. Okay, but we couldn't find the collar. Oh, we couldn't get a collar. Just a piece of satin. You would think that would be easy to find, but yeah, guess what? You yeah, could not. Ribbon. We could not. Yeah, yeah we like could not find it. Magic marker, just draw it around her neck. <laughs> but she didn't wear the mask very often. It's a very specific mask, too. Well, was it? What did she get? One that was like diamond shaped? No. Okay. No, it's, it's just a really regular, weird. It was like a kind of like a square shape, rectangle shape. Okay. Um. Yeah, she looked good. The. Boots that she was wearing were not that high of a heel because it's, you know, walking around a lot. So remember that. Not a high heel. But still, that's another story. So um, Jeannie and I walked around a bit and then she had her uh, book signing. She had her book signing on Saturday over at Mysterious Galaxy. Um, there, well, she started her book signing. I got to meet um, Kelly Dunn and her husband. They, well, during the book signing, um, they took me out. They, well, they stole me, I should say. And there, that's where we went to the Famous Monsters uh, booth. Yes. Yes, I'm dear. It back to I know, you. I know. Where I'm I got it. helpful. I know, yes, yeah, honey. <laughs> so, a lot of places, if you let them scan your ID, they give you like a little treat or a little something, something. So, they let little me. Son, son. Little son, son. Uh huh. So, I got a new lanyard for instead of the Penny Showtime's Penny Dreadful lanyard over at the Mo Famous Monsters booth, you got the 30th anniversary of Ghostbusters lanyard. It's very purple with faces on it. Yes, it's got the Ghostbusters. You really there's there's Stay Puff. And even stuff. even if you are watching it on YouTube, you're not going to really catch much of what that no, is. No, it's yeah, just no. going to look purple. So. They also have the magazines. I don't know if you remember these things back in the day. I remember them. I remember them, too. So, the, the they're coming back, the, the Famous Monsters magazines. They had um, the one for to celebrate the uh, Ghostbusters 30th anniversary. They had that. And then they have um, one that I got for Edward. Hi. The Famous Monsters, the Doctor Who edition. Ooh. So and yeah. Harryhausen. So they so it was really cold. Um, Kelly and her husband were really nice. Um, I it was it was good to meet them. So thank you for Stop taking me out. Skeletons. Yeah, I yeah. am. So um, after that, after Jeannie's signing, what did we do? Oh, um, did you go to Toscana? No, not yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, but wait. But wait. <laughs> Well, um, after the book signing, we went uh, we went to the LGBT uh, panel there. You know, the, the over at uh, San Diego Con, we went to the LGBT <laughs> okay. panel. Um, I was like, wait, there's a pause there, and I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing during that pause. I know, so it, it was my second year. I went there last year and had a good time. Um, this year, I had a good time. Jeannie went with me this year because, you know, last year she was disappointed she missed out because she went to another panel last year that she did that, that was totally boring, but she... So she wanted to come with me this year, and she had a good time. But um, because Did you guys have a good time? Yes, we had a good time at the LGBT okay. panel. Um, I met a lot of people, and some, and a couple of them remembered me from the previous year that I met. They cruised them. The, yeah, I did get cruised. Ta-da! LGBT panel, come on. Well, <laughs> here's the thing, is because the panel is actually an hour and a half long, and then for an hour after that is a net mix, is a mixer. Mm -hmm. You know, so I stayed, I always stayed a little bit afterwards for the mixer, and got, that's where I got cruised on. Not at, during the panel, but afterwards, after the little party afterwards. Okay. Um, Jeannie didn't stay for the panel because she had to go and get herself ready because she was moderating that night, like within an hour. The, they had a weird overlap for their panels. It was really weird. Yeah. But. So, Jeannie was a moderator. I think it was her first time being a moderator. At, well, it was her first time being a moderator at San Diego Comic Con. Right. Yeah, I could tell you that already. And that panel was the indie comics, wasn't small it? print indie comics one hundred and one panel. Yeah. Um, Jeff Jeffrey Tuig, Robert Roach, Brian Grant, uh, Graham, 
um, Johnny C and um, Brandon Perlo were the, all the panelists. And, was, and I met um, Brian uh, here. He's from Phoenix. So I met him previously before San Diego Comic Con. So it was neat to see him. He's a good guy. Um, I had a good time at the panel. It was a late Saturday night panel. It was like 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. Hmm. During the same time as mas the Masquerade. Masquerade. Da, 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 da. Look at you. But da, it was, da, da, da. and believe it or not, that was the dun, first dun, time dun, in the dun, panel, dun. in any <laughs> panel, or actually that was the first time at San Diego Comic Con that I actually got cold. Because you know a lot of these conventions, you they keep them, they keep the place cold. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I was cold. So after that was done, guess where we ended up? Toscana. We went to Toscana for late, 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 late dinner. I think it was like around ten, quarter to ten, ten o'clock. We were there for so long that they basically closed the kitchen on us. Um, Richard and Vicky from Museum you guys of had Robots. You to go back and make your own meals after a certain point. Yeah. Um, but we were drinking, we were drinking, so we didn't care. We had already eaten. Here's the keys. You, you guys lock up after yourselves yeah. when you're done. Richard and Vicky from Museum of Robots. Um, Scott came up. Um, this, uh, one woman who we met that day, her name is Jessica. She came, um, and, and joined us along with Terry, of course. And then eventually Veronica and her boyfriend, Kenny, came. But by the time Veronica and Kenny showed up, the kitchen was closed and they didn't have anything. They couldn't eat. Let me know when you start your last day. Okay. Almost there. Okay. So, oh yeah, that, that yeah. So, last day. Okay, hold on. <laughs> okay. And... Uh, 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 there we go. Okay. We were running out of... We were potentially going to run out of time during the last day. So I had to make a second segment. Oh, you know, technically we should have been stopping and starting this all this time because, you know, we ha I have videos. Oh, uh, too bad. I know. I just realized that once you did that, I'm like, oh, shoot, I have videos. What are you going to do? We'll post them all at the end, and that way you, I'll tell you what to intro for each one, I guess. Um, last day of San Diego Comic-Con. It was Sunday. 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 I was waiting for that. Um, Bloody Sunday. Veronica got hurt. Bloody Sunday. <laughs> Basically. Um, Veronica and Kenny stayed with Scott and I over at Scott's condo. Um, like I was saying, she was wearing boots. Low heel, but she was still wearing boots. And she was on her feet the whole time. You know, standing in line for four hours plus walking around. Um, she got a really nasty, gross blister slash gas gash at the bottom of her foot. You. Yeah. It was so Veronica didn't go to Comic Con on Sunday, and Kenny had to go back to Arizona because he lives here in Phoenix. So he had to go back because he's a lawyer, and had um, some court thing, lawyerish thing on Monday morning, so he couldn't stay. So is this the day that she popped her blister? Yes. <clears throat> so Scott got Kenny's ticket, and for the first time ever, Scott Michael Johnson went to San Diego Comic Con. He, Cat butt! Yes. Sit down, Screech. So, he enjoyed himself. Um, he helped us out because um, Kenny was um, Terry's uh, aide. Because Ke Terry um, was... She's going to bite me. Terry, needed, Terry had her canes with her because she's going to have her um, knee surgery. I think they said it, the VA said it, she's going to have it in February now. Okay. They pushed it back to February. It was supposed to be in September, now it's February. So, Scott helped her out throughout the day because, you know, walking and standing on, on the bad knees is not good for anybody. But anyway, so, uh, we saw a lot of things. Uh, we stopped at the Museum of Robots, said hi to Richard and Vicky. Um, I showed basically Scott San Diego Comic Con as much as you can in, what, five hours? Which, you know, is kind of like a fast going through. At the outside, we went to see the Sleepy Hollow... We went to see Simpsons. We went to see the the Gotham's zip line where I got another lanyard. For... Simpsons, Sleepy Dee Hollow, and Batman. Name three things that Danny Elfman has done the soundtrack for. For the most part, yeah. So I got a lanyard from Gotham, um, and and then Jeannie had a her book signing on Sunday, and over at the Penguin booth. 
so she did that, and um, Scott and I walked around some, so I could show him some more. Um, and then we walked around and we went shopping. And there we went. I saw A to Z. Todd. Shopping, shopping, shopping. Uh, Todd Clark. He writes the Lola comic from Go Comics. Um, he signed. He he signed and drew. Lola, who is kind of like an elderly woman who still acts like, you know, she's a kid. So that was cool. Um, got to meet him. And then our, our usual people. Oops, there it goes again. I already know I'm going to have problems with this. Um, Gary. And we need to super glue it to your face. Basically. Um, the, there's an ar artist that his name is Gary. Really? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm doing two things. <laughs> I can't, I'm a male. I can't do this. Like multitask so anyways um love that artwork by gary gary <laughs> G gary montablano 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 yeah we genie always gets some st gets stuff from here and i actually like his stuff so this is this year's we, i got something last year so that's this year's it looks like some sort of monolith it's a monolith thing. yeah it's a, very, a tiger it, yeah he does he does a lot of um, tiger work. It's either pansies which is or right, Which is why Jeannie likes, likes this stuff because he does oh, a lot. Oh, sorry, of... sorry, little girl. I wasn't meaning to hit you with a. Uh, oh, well, so um, Jeannie had bought me these earrings, which one of them keeps falling down. But I think that's the reason why they keep falling down is it's in the my left ear, which has two holes. Yeah, okay. So, but these are drag queen earrings I've been wearing because I'm getting my ears ready because I'm going to be doing drag very tomorrow. Very tomorrow. Very soon. So after that, um, the whole day of Sunday of Comic Con, we went out to dinner. Toscana. To Toscana again. Um, we had already warned them that this is going to be a bigger, longer event with us. You know, party. Bigger, longer, uncut. And so they gave us the back patio to hang out at. And so there, you know, you had, it was me, it was Jeannie, it was Terry, Michelle, Brian, Veronica, Casey, Antonio, Glenn, and Scott, and Toka. I now have the song Veronica going through my head. So we hung out, I think, but that time it was only about three hours. And then after we went to Toscana, mm. that included dinner and drinks and dessert, we did went, uh, walked down to Ghirardelli's and had... More dessert. And so did that. And then, um, let's see, trying to think. Then that was Sunday. That was the end of con. On Monday, um, what did happen? Oh, on Monday, Veronica, Jeannie, and I went to the big kitchen for breakfast. And then from there, um, we took Veronica back to her car because she had to drive back up to L.A. Um, and so Jeannie and I met Brian and Michelle over at the San Diego Zoo at 12.30. And we spent a nice day at the zoo. Because, you know, hey, walking around the San Diego Comic Con wasn't enough. We had to walk around the zoo for five hours. You got to see six. your girlfriend. I got to see my girlfriend, uh, Delilah. I love Delilah. Uh, I adore her. Um, and who's Delilah? Delilah is a southern hornbill at the San Diego Zoo. She knows her name. So if you ever go to the San Diego Zoo, and you go, I don't know what the name of the area is, but basically where the rhinoceros and the giraffes are. Oh, where they have the animals? Yes. Well, they all have different areas. You know, like there's an elephant odyssey, there's a tiger river, blah, blah, blah. This used to be where the elephants were, but they moved them to the elephant odyssey. This is where the giraffes and the rhinos are. Um, she's a southern hornbill. Horn bill. Um, she's gorgeous. She knows her name. Uh, Scott and I, and then Mr. Hickman and Sweetie, we had met her back in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, and she comes to you, she or she comes to me, she adores Mr. Hickman more than anyone else, I mean, she would, you know, play around with it, but she gave me a twig. <laughs> <laughs> she would play around with him? Yes, they used to play hide and seek. Okay, that sounds so much better. Dirty, dirty bird. So, um... So this time around, she gave me a twig, and, and I had a nice time with her. I always say hi to her, and I told Michelle and Brian that anytime you guys go to the San Diego Zoo, go and say hi to her and, and say hi, because unfortunately where she is now, um, 
here next to rhinos and giraffes. So a lot of people just bypass it because, you know, those are the bigger name animals. Oh. So they bypass her. And so I made them, just told them to do it. And so anybody else in out there in the, the pod world, interwebs, if you ever go to the San Diego Zoo, please say hi to my girlfriend, Delilah. You'll love her. She's a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. Delilah. Um, then after that, we went out to dinner. Not Toscana, though. We went to a Thai place, and I can't think of their name. I want to say Royal Thai. I think that's right. So anyways, we went out to dinner, um, and then uh, that was on Monday. And then on Tuesday, we went for breakfast or brunch. We went to D.Z. Aikens, which is a Jewish deli in San Diego. And from there, and then we went home. And that was basically the San Diego trip in a nutshell. There's a little bit more things here and there. So when I got home, like I said, it took me a while to get to recover because certain things happened when I got home. A good friend of mine, Paul, had heart surgery on Tuesday the 29th when we were in um, San Diego. I got the phone call when we were at DZ Aikens that he, the, it was successful. They replaced his valve. But while they were in there... He, they found two holes in his heart. So he was, so I stayed with him for about, what, two, three days? Yeah. You know, take care of him when he got out of the hospital the first time and to make sure he was doing well. And then Jeannie ended up getting sick. She thought it was onions. She, it turns out while we were in they San Diego. Onions. Yeah, it turns out while we were in San Diego Comic Con, she had uh, gallstones and passed them. And when she was still having some issues. And so they removed the gallbladder on her. So, yay. <laughs> that yay? was, yay. She has, she's gallbladder list Yes. That means she can't have any more little baby gallstones. No, right, exactly. And then... I um, hope she was ready for that decision. Yeah. Or, or at least her husband was ready for that decision. Yes. And trying to think, and then what else has been going on? Oh, I finished um, uh, the Penumbra uh, July issue, which had Jeannie's um, Mr. Dash Saves the World. Did you read all the stories? No, I only read Mr. Dash. It's all, shush, Mr. Dash was took half the magazine. I know. It was a long, long story. The reason why I mentioned it, Mr. Dash, and Jeannie told and Jeannie's was disappointed in the fact that it was on a magazine. She can't really acknowledge anybody. She wanted to acknowledge, and and I'm saying this myself. She's acknowledging me because I'm the one who gave her the title of the story. So I gave her the idea of Mr. Dash Save the World. So yay me. Oh, all she about uses me. my story title. I still have it. She hasn't. She's, She's planning on using it, but oh. she's she hasn't picked it up yet. Okay. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And so that is basically it in a nutshell. Um, what is coming Coconut. up? Yeah. Um, what is coming up next weekend, the uh, August 22nd through the 24th? Saturday. Ow, that was my year. That's more than Saturday. But Saturday is coming up. What would that mean about anything? I was just guessing. Okay. It is CopperCon. It's a, a sci-fi and fantasy convention here in Arizona. It's going to be at the Hilton Garden Inn in Avondale, Arizona. I believe it's like, what, the 40th one? Or the I don't know. They 30th or it, something there's like There's nothing here on the website saying Yeah, that. they stopped numbering the CopperCons. Yeah. It's weird. So some of the people that's coming that will be there will be Adam. I'm just going to Chatterow. Ch I don't Chad, know. Chad Chatterow. He's a zombie expert. Um, Casey. Um, uh, Casey. I'm not going to say these Casey. last names. Kaki. 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 Yeah. Casey, who is a, S, a, a, a FX makeup artist. Good thing her first name isn't Boo. Um, then we have Emmett Plant, who's a sci-fi sound expert. <laughs> Plant, we felt fairly secure on that one. Yeah, that's a, yeah. And some of these I could feel so, you know secure on. Yeah, so the rest of these looking so pretty good so, so far. So far, um, David A. Williams, he's a science guest. Science. Uh, Leslie Fish, she's the music guest. 
Filking. And then we have, as our authors, these are some of the authors, is Sharon Sk Skinner, Marshila Rockwell, Jeffrey Marriott, and Jeannie Koch are some of the authors that are going to be there next weekend. There are other That's authors. That's odd. What? Why wouldn't they mention Stackpole? Because this came out before Stackpole said yes. Oh, okay. But there are others. I mean, I could pull them up as well. Um, like uh, Michael Stackpole is going to be there. I, I'm going to be a moderator there, and he's yeah. on, like, I think two of my panels. Uh, Aaron Quinn is going to be there. Aaron Quinn! Mark Rood. Mark is Rood! Is going to be there. He's very surprised that it's happening so soon. Uh, Terry, Smith. Terry Smith is going to be there. I'm trying to think. Um, oh, and then and, and Tina, stay tuned for more information is going to be there. And and Tina Williams is going to be there as well. Tina Williams. So, um, and you're going to be there. And then I will be there because. And you're going to be there. And Edward's going to be the be there. And Edward's going to be the moderator. Well, not the moderator. Uh, a moderator. Yeah. yeah, there's, there's a couple like others. about three or four. Yeah. Um, but Edward's going to be moderating there on Saturday and Sunday. I'll be there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, I have to work Friday. Yeah. Yeah. I am working all weekend. Because with Jeannie being, you know, still recovering. Yeah. Oh, and then um, Duncan is doing the bookstore, so so Duncan and Andrea will be there. And my writing partner, Andrea. Yep. And trying to think of... Oh. Oh. Oh! Uh, magazine. Magazine! Compete. Oh, you don't have the one. What one? The new one. This is the new one. What about the one with the guy coming out? This is in there. Oh, it is in there? I thought he was the right cover there. story. No. I thought he was the cover story. No. I thought the pictures that I saw was showed the cover. Sorry. My no, 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 no. Okay. Um, uh, the new issue of, of Compete Sports Magazine. Speak, compete um, Diversity Sports Magazine came out. Diversity Sports. Diversity Sports. And we made the national news. The magazine national made news. national news because they broke the story, or we broke the story. Before anyone else. About, um, I can't think of his name. This dude. This guy. That would be his name. Oh, no, no, that's, that's Sun a, Devils. That's yeah, a Sun Devils. Yeah, yeah, no, his name is Sun Devil. Yes, dear. Chip Seraphin. Edward Chip um, Seraphin. Yeah. Uh, from Yay! The number number <laughs> number seventy nine of the Arizona State Sun Devils. Uh, he's a linebacker in um, on their football team. Came with out gay with a beard. Yeah, he's 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 he's, he's very. He's a young bear. He's a young bear. He actually kind of looks familiar, but that's another story. <laughs> um, so we made the news. Ugh. The magazine made the news. And they were on Good Man in America. They were on all this other stuff. So don't give me that look. Good girl. for compete. I was trying to help you. Congratulations, um, and thank you for coming out, uh, Chip. Before you know, say it's okay to be gay, kind of a thing, especially when you're dealing with sports. Um, speaking of sports, um, Brittany Griner uh, of the Phoenix Mercury, uh, who has been an out person and is really into gay. the anti, in, really into the anti bullying, she proposed to her girlfriend. Yesterday, oh, so yeah. During the get, game? No. Because that would be cool. No, but her girlfriend plays for the Oklahoma um, Shock, I believe. Oh? And uh, yeah, is is on the, is in another team. So it'll be interesting if they get married. Do they still play <laughs> opposite of each other every so often? Um, trying to think of there was one more thing I can't think of right now. I just drew a blank. <laughs> oh, we've got three videos for you. That's all going to be jumbled up right at the end. Because I completely forgot to talk about, say, to do pauses in between. The first video is the um, world building with Genie on there. Um, the second video is the LGBT panel. And the last video will be uh, the small print 101 comic uh, panel. So those are the three videos that from the San Diego Comic Con. All right, that's all I got. This ran a little longer than I thought, but hey, we had to do a lot of catching up. A lot um, of catching up. We'll, we'll be better at catching up and, and doing out things, even if it's just going to be me. Um, we still have to catch up on Face Off, Project Runway. You even have to catch up on Face Off, Project Runway. Um, <laughs> 
uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but there was some sad news recently. There's been a lot of passings of of people. Um, you've got the big big names, you know, Robin Williams, and then um, Lauren Bacall, and, and Dupring, Dupring, and then Horshack now. Yes. Um, but also a big, uh, another huge name you here. You have no idea who Dupring is, do you? Yes, I do. Okay. It's Fox's wife. Oh, okay. She wasn't really married to him. Well, you know, okay. The Vulcan <laughs> consort. Um, the, if you lived and here in Arizona. survivor Ari girl from Texas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, too. Oh, yeah, I remember hearing about that. Yeah. But, um, the, the big one here, if you lived here in Arizona at any time between 1955 to 1987, um, Wallace passed away from the Wallace and Ladmo show. So. You know, I wanted to sing the beginning of the Wallace and Ladmo show thing, but when you're saying that he's passing, it seems inappropriate to go ho, ho, ha, ha, hee, hee, ha, ha. Yeah, it does. It does seem really inappropriate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, thank you for staking out with us. I'm sorry we're late again, but we'll be and back. And this is our next real long episode. Very long episode. But, you but know. that's okay. We're catching up. We're trying to catch up. All right. Good night, good morning, goodbye. Toodles! Bing. Okay, so I know you guys are used to seeing like some music video or something like that at the end of these, but not going to do that this week. Not this time. This time you're going to get to see all those little videos that Joseph was talking about from Comic-Con. Ta-da! So, buckle up and strap on your Comic-Con boots boots? I don't know. In the meantime, don't forget about Joshua Tree Feeding Program. They are a non-profit organization that helps people with HIV and AIDS get food. They have a sister program that helps people feed their pets so they don't have to choose between feeding themselves and feeding their pets. You can contact them at www.jtfp.org. And then also don't forget about Compete Magazine. Look at that, they broke a story that became a national story. Ha! Huh? Go check them out on their website. I'll put a link down there. Down there somewhere. And, wow, that's that's it that I can think of at this moment. Um, if you get a chance, check out um, ScreamQueens.com. Patrick is a hoot. Check out the Satyr Sphere, because we love Scott and Cindy. And also, if you're needing a good fix of mathematics, well, Math Monkeys is getting its its math on again. And also, if you want to hear more comic book stuff and a nice little comic book story, Four Color Storytime is getting its gear back on, too. So, and then next week we will... Oh, well, I'll have a little story to tell you guys. This week... After we did the podcast, things became very colorful. So we will talk about that probably next episode. Ooh, a cliffhanger. Something for you to anticipate. Anyway, on to con... podcast... clip time. Catch you next time. Bye! We have a scientist who's really into the science and he's describing things in detail. And the average reader's going to find that really boring. Where's the balance between he's telling him from his point of view and it's a jack o' lantern tree, the reader just says this is perfect. Some of that depends on whether you're writing um, hard science fiction or soft science fiction. Hard science fiction readers expect the full Monty on that. Uh, soft science fiction, of which I write, <laughs> um, basically I will let um, the scientific character give you know my main scientific answer, which is it's a spatio temporal warp filtered through black hole technology with an aerospheric center and then with the... Wee! Woohoo! And there were both the That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 crystals. Yeah. Uh, but, there you go. Yeah. But basically, I limit that, but, but then, again, I'm writing soft science fiction. In hard science fiction, seriously, they want that. If you don't do that kind of explanation, if you choose that you're going to write hard science fiction, or even like even hard fantasy, where it's you know it's definitely more you've got a lot more science going on in technology, and your magic is more of a scientific system and that kind of thing. Those readers will expect it, and they will be disappointed if you aren't giving them the full on. This is how we built the spaceship. My people don't care, thank God. Uh, they just want to get in the spaceship and go on an adventure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sucking science. <laughs>
<laughs> hated science, and science hated me. <laughs> but uh, I'm lucky because I have a friend who's getting his doctorate in some kind of science course. <laughs> and uh, I'll say, hey, Tony, man, I'm doing this, and this, has to, this characteristic has to occur, and I just want to come up with uh, something that may be realistic as far as the storyline is concerned. Said, hey, you can give it a drive that, that's based on this solar principle, and it's like, good, get the credit. <laughs> my husband's degree is mechanical engineering, oh. so I'm like, so, how does that work? <laughs> he tells, tells me all the boring stuff, I distilled that down into three interesting lines. Can you even turn to the sound of the most authoritative? My dad is part of it. Like, tell me about, you know, I don't know, a carburetor or something. Yeah. I had a scene in a book where a woman has a truck, and the truck breaks down in the desert. And I thought, oh God, now I'm going to have to research about trucks. And so in the book, a guy comes by and pulls over, and he looks under the hood, and he goes, you need a tow. And she says, what's wrong with my truck? And he goes, do you care? <laughs> Can whoever's asking stand up because we can't hear you? Could you please stand up? And don't be shy, man. Shyness is not allowed. Okay. Not allowed. Something you have to 
play around with it for at least 10,000 hours before you yeah. really start to kick ass. Uh, I also teach uh, illustration at Otis College of Art, and I do explain it this way. Um, if you are born with the talent to be an illustrator, uh, you might be a savant. Some kids, we've all seen kids 16 years old or whatever, and they're drawn out the ass. And maybe you're born congenitally with this number of mistakes, and that kid is born with this number of mistakes. But if she is lazy and doesn't work the craft, and you bust your ass, you throw away mistakes. And maybe you get to where your mistakes are here, and because she hasn't busted her ass, hers has stayed there. She was born with more latent talent, but because of your application, you have risen to a higher degree of professionalism. You have to work it. You've got to work it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so in building a world, and you have particularly differences between our world and the world you've built, um, do you use uh, them to uh, illustrate some commentary you might want to make about our world, or is it pretty much purely going to be, uh, I mean, you do that in a very subtle way so it doesn't jolt the reader around, but or is it purely going to be the world uh, to facilitate some character or story that, you know, or some, uh, and, and allow the, any allegory you want to make go, go through the actions of the character? Any way you want to do it. Yeah. It's like you, you can make, you can make a, a world that has nothing to do with this world, and it, it, it can be just as satisfying as a world that is a commentary on this world. Uh, that's, that is your personal preference. I guess to, to specify, have you ever written a story that was like that? that, that kind of, yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, pretty much everything that I have written has had some little dig that pushes back at, at the real world. It's, it's like, I'm a sort of, a, you know, my, my, my writing is generally kind of more on the humor end of things, and so I'm always satirizing current culture disguised as fantasy culture, disguised as science fiction. Cool. Yes. When you do tell stories, how how do, and I think one of the answers is, of course, just like anybody else, but how do queer and trans characters particularly happen? Is it a, I need one sometimes? Is it a, well, here's a character, I need them to serve this story purpose, and what do I, what do I know about them? What, what makes them tick? Or, or what else is it? You know, how does it how does it happen, or do they just kind of end up being who they are? That's a really good question because sometimes it is very deliberate. Sometimes it's like, you know, what this, uh, you know, I'm introducing a group of people, and I want one of them to be an LGBT character, or I want three of them to be an LGBT, LGBT characters, and that was, you know, and that is. Um, a very conscious thing, but a lot of the time, especially in my own original content, the people, the, the characters really show up fully formed for me, um, or not fully formed, but just like they're the core of who they are. It's not a calculated thing. It's just they come into existence. Like I, I'm doing a series called The Woods for Boom, uh, and really each of the core cast is a different aspect of my personality, and you know some of them are straight, some of them are. Uh, gay and some of them are somewhere in the middle or don't care uh, and that's something that you know will span out over the course of the series but uh, I knew who they were when I sort of took them out of my head and put them on the page. Um, for me um, it depends um, on whether or not like um, I'm going to make a uh, like a horror comic like I usually do or I've done a few romances and my happy romance stories are always all gay characters. Um, uh, and my uh, horror comics, <laughs> they're always straight people. <laughs> but, like, or, or there are some gay characters, but like it's not explicit, like sort of what Noel was saying. Like I, I sort of have this image of them in my head, but like it, it doesn't really pertain to the story. So um, you know, it might come out in other ways with their personality or whatever, but it, 
it's not like closer to the reader. But in that, and that is just because, again, like Noelle was saying, like I don't <laughs> want to constantly, because my horror stories, like nobody wins. They're not glamorous. It's horrible. The main characters are horrible people to begin with. It's all the way through a bummer. And I don't want to like also like keep that on a person's head <laughs> who's also got to deal with like, you know, people hating them for being gay or something like that. And <laughs> so my happy stories, all gay characters. Uh, Horror stories, the, the terrors of heterosexuality. <laughs> <laughs> we can all imagine those by ourselves. I, oh, sorry. Um, and I find that, I don't know, I find that really, that kind of back and forth really interesting. Emily, especially because, like, you know, it, it is a way that, you know, we, we all have ways, I guess, that our sexuality um, and our queerness uh, directly or... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. This is my first time. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, we have all have ways that kind of our sexuality and the way we exist in the world and our queerness um, affects our work directly and indirectly. And like you kind of brought up a way it kind of affects it indirectly where you're like, man, I really, I don't want to... I really would rather not be, be killing the lesbian at the end of this story. Um, but how, I guess, what is an indirect way, I guess, that um, your, your queerness affects your work? And I, I guess I'm asking this because um, I'm an editor, and so I make a lot of all-ages comics that aren't overtly queer. Um, so this is kind of the queer sensibility exactly, question? Exactly. It's the queer sensibility question. Um, you know, it, my queerness informs the people I cast and the stories that I choose to tell, so. Well, well I, I'll, I can start if you don't mind. Yeah, Maybe go for it. Uh, <laughs> I would say that uh, uh, because I, I sort of have an all walks of life background, yeah. um, you know, I've a, I come from a multi-ethnic ethnic household, um, you know, I'm around all levels of queerness professionally and <laughs> personally, so, uh, I would say it just makes me more um, cognizant uh, and present to diversity, uh, just as a matter of fact, which isn't as common as it may be for some of us. Um, you know, maybe not that um, Caucasian heterosexual male may not have that same experience unless they are actively um, in an environment or they have loved ones or people around them that um, affect that, that thought process. So I would say absolutely, you know, 110 um, percent. It, in, it informs uh, uh, my process, my creativity. You know, how I come up with things on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Um, I was just sorry. I don't want to talk with anyone else. Yeah, do it. Um, <laughs> uh, I think um, it, for me, and this might sound odd, but how it influences how I work is. Um, Again, it goes back to that thing that you were talking about, about um, not seeing yourself in the mainstream uh, so much. And uh, it, with me, it wasn't even just any, like what I looked like or my sexuality or anything like that. It was also the way I drew and the way I wrote, like everything. <laughs> no, I had no idea, like I didn't think I was ever going to make comics professionally. Um, and so I feel like a lot of my experiments uh, with the form um, in web comics, um, especially, uh, and just finding uh, different methods of telling a story that deviate from like uh, the traditional methods of you know, like a, a paper book or, or panels or things like that. Um, even just how to explore uh, non-traditional methods of storytelling, I think, is a way in which I kind of, kind of like uh, queerness comes out in my work, I think, ultimately. Well, I mean, I'm trying to think. Of, it's, that's a really tough question. I know it is. It's, um, it's interesting. We actually talked for like 20 minutes. Yeah, so we talked for like 20 minutes about this yesterday, which is why I saw it. I'll tell you, I have a voice memo of our sitting and planning this on my phone. It was so much fun that I have, I was really tempted to open the panel <laughs> by just standing here for like 35 minutes and <laughs> it into the mic when I decided that it, we really were totally engrossed in it, but you might be a little yeah. less so. Yeah. Um, but uh, the th the thing is, is that uh, it's something that I became very conscious of uh, around, like, in the last, I mean, I, just the fact that I work on such a major scale in the mainstream, um, working on the Batman line, and, 
you know, it's not, it's a place where at the beginning I definitely, like, I did feel a kind of like, do I need to sort of repress myself to pull out a more masculine character? Like writing Batman, like it's ma Batman's pure masculinity and you know, macho heterosexuality. And I mean, that's debatable, but that's- That's not what Dr. Like, Wortham said, as I recall. <laughs> but I mean, like that's the, but it, it's, it's coming in from a different place and it's trying to like, you know, there are moments where you do want to put yourself in there, but it's like, is it fully appropriate for me to put myself into a licensed character who uh, isn't designed to be this? And it's, it stopped mattering at a certain point. Uh, and it stopped being something that I wor worried about because the more you are yourself, the more yourself bleeds into your work, regardless of uh, you know what you're thinking and how many times you sort of debate, debate against it. And, you know, I, I think that there, I, I'm not sure what you could point to uh, in terms of like, you know, a scene that I'm writing that's, you know, just Batman, you know, punching a dude uh, that is like, that comes from my queerness, but my queerness affects everything I write, so it does. Um, as someone who isn't necessarily engaged in the process of making comics, but I write about comics and I make documentaries about artists, I feel like in the past four or five years it's become really important for me to sort of infuse everything I do with queerness and an exploration of sexuality and sexual identity. Just because, you know, hashtag YOLO, you only live once, <laughs> we're gonna die and if we don't talk about these things now, we never will. <laughs> and I just wanted to add one more thing too to that. I think speaking to that, this, this, uh, because it is a broader discussion. It's part of the reason why something like BitCon I think is important. Um, part of the reason why uh, that uh, venue was created was because this, these conversations aren't typical at conventions across the board, and so BenCon was meant to be a voice for, uh, and a space of recognition for uh, queer presence, regardless of how it showed up, whether it's mainstream, not so mainstream, direct or indirect, um, meaning that person might be outwardly gay, but it doesn't reflect in their work, or maybe their queerness doesn't for their work. I thought having that environment in itself um, becomes a conversation, and I think it's important to have those expressions in place because Again, like you were saying before, um, you know, who we are matters, and we don't often get examples of that, and so that is uh, why I think it's important that we continue to have conversations like this. That's actually, a, you know, I have a few questions that I prepared for specific people, and you're like probably 25% of the way into what I was going to ask you to do there. Um, you know, at the risk of Comic-Con turning off the mics, and I know you're not going to do it, I'm just joking. Um, you know, let's talk about MedCon some more. Um, what will people expect to see? What's different about the experience? Give some examples. Um, you know, I've had a gas the last few years, but um, how many of you have been? I, as always, I ask the, exactly the wrong side of the question. Um, which, which means a bunch of you, not so much, and um, it's not that far, it's in Burbank. So, um, why don't you plug some, but really talk about, you know, what's different and richer and special compared to queer programming at mainstream cons. Um. It's just matter of fact. <laughs> I guess it's the one show you can come to and and not uh, necessarily guess is that person queer or not. Nine times out of ten, they are. <laughs> and and I think the thing that struck me too, just even in the last year, I, it really minor, small thing, but it was I thought it was significant. You know, I saw um, two, you know, obviously coupled up uh, girls, you know, walking down the foyer from one panel to the next, and they were holding hands and. You know, and it was just like, oh, oh yeah, you know, the little things that, not to say that those things don't happen here, but 
that was just such an obvious, like, oh yeah, you can be yourself here and not worry about anyone batting an eye or thinking anything less of, of, that, of that expression. So um, that would be one of them. One of them. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually not, I'll, I'll yield right after the other half of the question, which is just give us an idea of some programming things or other things going on that we would see, that we see at VidCon that we wouldn't see here. Just from um, the programming. Yeah, from the programming. Yeah. Uh, well, well, our version of the masquerade is a costume catwalk. Awesome. So, <laughs> so there's that, I guess. It's a little bit more, um, yeah, it's a bit more of the, the, the queer sensibility. I mean, we're, we're adding fashion shows this year. Um, I think of all of the, the creators, I think it's, it's great because when we have the non-queer person that comes to the show, a lot of times when they hear LGBT, they assume um, it's only sex. And when they come to the show, nine times out of ten, they're surprised that, oh, there's all this other stuff. You know, there's, you know, the, the funny books, there's the fantasy adventure, there's the, you know, the romance. It's not all regulated to um, being self-defined by who we're attracted to. I find is, what's the biggest hurdle you've had to overcome? What's, what's the thing that, that is the hardest thing that you've had to do um, working independently um, to get your visions across out there and see them? I think for me at least, um, the actual work of like actually getting it done and like, you know, the problem solving, I mean, that's, that's the normal day to day work, but I don't think that's the biggest hurdle because you eventually figure out what's working and what's not, you know, whether it's in the writing or in the art, and you get it done. Um, I would say probably it's just getting it out there, letting people know it exists. I think just the whole promotion and um, marketing is the absolute toughest thing. I think you have a, um, a comics press and a nerd press that's very reticent to like accept uh, independent work. It's like they're too much in love with the Marvel and DC work and also image. And then don't get me wrong, they're making some great stuff in those companies. But most of the stuff that they're making is not of superior quality. I actually think many of the stuff that people like us are doing is actually different and more unique and, and, inter and more interesting than a lot of stuff that the big guys are doing. And it, I feel like it's like weird that we're not getting that coverage, we're not getting the reviews, and that leads to all these things. So I think that is the biggest hurdle is just the marketing and promotion. So uh, for Sartana, one of the issues that I kind of tend to run into was one of my benefits. It was, one, it was part of my attack plan that kind of also backfired on me. So Sartana was assembled through an initial contacts that I could hear at San Diego Comic Con through the Creators Connection. Now that's helped by uh, Doug and Corey from Toucan Learning Systems. They have a booth downstairs near small print. Great guys, go check it out. If you're into this kind of stuff, you want to make a book, that's the best the place to start. There, that's ground zero right there. So my plan of attack with Sartana is I met Joseph Arnold, my artist, here in San Diego, but he's from Colorado. He already worked with the publisher of CCP out of Austin, Texas. I'm out of Boston, Mass. Our colorist on the inside, Joe did the color, color on the cover. The inside of the color is done by a kid named Eugene Bedalou out of Mondova. And so my you know, plan of attack here was to assemble this team from all over so equal, people have equal stake in it so they equally promote it. So this is going to get promotion overseas, East Coast, West Coast. I do all, I always do the con circuit, so I'm bringing it everywhere. So, I mean, like, like you said, it's kind of tough you know, when you're promoting your book and you're trying to push it in people's hands. You see it on the floor all the time. People are handing out tickets. Uh, bookmarks, hey, check out my book, and then people just turn around and throw it away. But if, you, if you're doing it on a one-on-one -on -one basis, if you're, you know, bringing, if you're doing the footwork, if you're taking it to the streets, so to speak, you're like, hey, check out my book, hey, check out my book, check this out, I made this. Uh, I tell people I made this because I wanted to go to Comic-Con for free. And that's true. That's 100% true. This is my sixth year going to Comic-Con. I went in 2009, much like everybody else, I caught the bug. And I'm like, I gotta keep going back to this place because this is where my people are at. I'm at home here. 
So, you know, the first three years were fandom. Then the last three years have been trying to get the professional badge and, and making it happen. And next thing I know, here I am. If you told me, like, six years ago I'd be on a panel at San Diego Comic-Con, I'd say that you're nuts. And I, I never Still thought nuts. I'd... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're all a little nuts, but... But, yeah, I mean, so, but here I am. You know, I mean? it's very surreal for me because it's like, it was three years ago, it was the last time I was here in San Diego, mm -hmm. and I barely spent any time at conventional. I was actually at the Trickster most of the time, and uh, even before that I was at the Comic-Con. This is like the first year I'm like, not a fanboy, it's like I am truly professional, not just a professional who likes comics, but now I'm like an actual comics professional, and like actually, you know, here, you know, giving, you know, advice and you know, talking about stuff, so it's definitely a different position Absolutely. than being the guy just looking to buy stuff like that. Now that I'm publishing, it's like I don't even have money to buy stuff. Right, no, that, that's, that, was my, that was my problem this year, is getting, you know, extra issues of Sartan, and I'm like, wow. I really can't buy that exclusive on the floor I really wanted. But, uh, you know, and it's all part of it. So I don't kind of just to go back to it. So my attack plan was to kind of get coverage across the globe. But then now I didn't have FaceTime with a lot of my collaborators. You know, everything was done electronically. So, you know, you send an email, my artist, we will work, he's working for free. God love him. Joe is, is such a great artist. And, you know, I can only say, hey, this page didn't come out the way I envisioned it so many times. So in turn, Joe made me a better writer, being more descriptive, and I scripted for comics specifically. And uh, in, in turn, that was kind of one of the challenges I faced, is that, you know, it, it, I, I, you lose control. You lose control when you don't, you don't have it, you know, you, you can't just go to the guy's house and be like, hey, let's lay it out and let's take a look at it. Uh, I think for me, I think lovely doing mom pop shop restaurants and opening restaurants for so long, the marketing, the grassroots efforts has become second nature to me. I'm not shy, I don't, you know, that doesn't bother me, but personally, I think the con circuit has been the hardest challenge. And I feel it's, it's the thing that needs to be said that almost nobody says. Um, you know, it's a Comic Con and, and you get to these things. And Phoenix is where I'm based out of. I'm really proud of the show. The last five years ago, it was like 35,000 or something. They just hit almost 80. You know, but the bigger it gets, the less people are actually into comics. And then, let alone self published things. And then my books, the superhero books, I'm automatically compared to Marvel and DC. Um, but you know what? If I do the superhero book, if you've got an unusual take, you're in a better situation than myself because you know you could at least maybe attract some of those Marvel or DC fans yeah. into your title because you have something, but you've got to have that hook that might get them up. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree. I, I would say in terms of cons that, that the bigger problem is that you're a small publisher. If you're going in as a small publisher, at least to some of these bigger ones like this one from New York, they charge you an online for a small publisher. In fact, most of the time when you're a small publisher, you really only got one book. So if you're not the quote artist doing the book, that could cost a lot of money. So the thing is, if you can get into an artist alley, you know, and even better, if you can split it with someone else, it's like that reduces your operating costs, and that's a better chance of you, like at least not losing your shirt oh, at a show. Yeah. That's not for, I, I get all that. That was that's not the challenge for me personally. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I also think the grassroots I'm good at like pushing my book out there, so I can I can move copies. But I think. I don't do prints, I don't do fan art, and there's nothing wrong with it, but that's not my goal. My goal is to just tell stories. Mm -hmm. I don't feel, you know, I can do it, and those things like spend 12 hours on a pay, um, to do a, a print, but I'd rather work on my story, and, you know, right, do a page in 12 hours. Uh, and I think the emotional, the emotional part of seeing print after print of Power Girl or whatever, like airbrush, big boobs, every five seconds, which again, there's nothing wrong with those things, that's what they're into. I'm like, what happened to the days where people went to search out for those artists to find something you can't find anymore? It's, that's the part, for me, that to this day, it's just, like, it's just hard. I know how it is, we all, we, all of us are broke, all of our money goes right into this. And it's a damn Power Girl print. It was 20 bucks, I'm like, you could have bought, you know, four books from us, yeah, mm -hmm. for that $20, and it's just, it's frustrating, but you know, I can try to see the other side of those prints also have to be there to sell the tickets, but it's just it's just frustrating. I don't know.
I wish cons in a way would somehow, and you know, this is different, but do something for those small guys to push us, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're the ones who, if this trend busts in 10 years, we're the ones who are still going to be here, and we're the ones that are still, you know, that's the, that's the hard part for me. The frustrating. It's, it's not frustrating, it's just, it's yeah. Yeah. Just, just to jump off, so killing by, by Sunday at three. <coughs> dead, I'm like, oh my god. Uh, I was just gonna say, just to jump off that though, that's kind of the importance of doing your local con, even though it's, you right. know, you're getting some, you know, only even if you're getting only like 500 people. You know, if there's a small con, that's the important thing. You build yourself there because yeah, uh, those people five. travel. You know, that's a, that's common. I may interject because when you're saying small, that's 500. Um, I go to cons because it's, it's the same thing for authors. It doesn't matter if you put big six or big five or not. Um, there can be cons that are, you know, 50 people. Right. right. Um, and if you can get to them, you can actually make that connection with somebody, and they care way more about buying something from John, Brian, or Rich, you know, Robert or Jeff or whoever than just some random guy. I care way more about getting Watson and Holmes because I know Brandon right now, you know, than Don. So, somebody so knows that a smaller convention is more serious <coughs> about looking at your independent book than, yeah. no, and they're, 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 yeah, they're, they're, not there, they're not there for Spider-Man. Like a great sure. example is, <coughs> pardon me, too many panels, too much talk, um, <laughs> is Ekbok, uh, East Coast Black Age of Commerce. In the Schomburg. Yes. They, yes, in, in New York. So you have maybe 200, 300 people showing up, but they are motivated buyers. They are there to buy. They're not there to maybe check it out. Yes. And, but they're all motivated for what you have. And that, that makes a big difference with some of the quote unquote smaller, smaller cons. And it, uh, to piggyback on what has been said to this point, yeah, how many times are you? I'm in Artist Alley right now. And by the way, what was E E01. Thank you, Donna. You know I love it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no one else has a booth, right? No one else has a booth at the panel. Just get a final. Easy. Yes. Easy, easy, zero one. And, but uh, book and it's, it happens every you, you just can't even let it be frustrating after a while <coughs> because you're going to have people come in on Sunday and say, man, I like this. I've I blew all my money already. And they blew it on some maquette that they bought that they stood in line for and this, that, and the other thing. And you, well, you, might, you, can, you, 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 you can punch them in the throat, <laughs> but still not going to buy a book because they don't have any money left because they blew it on that. I, I, I find that my, my biggest challenge is a, a coin that has time and money on opposite sides. And if you have, if you don't have money, then you have to do it yourself and that takes time. And if you want to speed up the process, that's going to cost you money. And so this is, and it goes across the board, you're going to have to pay money for your promotions and these types of things, unless you are very, very fortunate, you do a kick-ass job on a book and it's nominated for an Eisner, and all of a sudden people want to interview you about that kick-ass book, <laughs> and all of a sudden the sales do a decent jump, then, then, then you don't have to worry about that money to promote things. But for the rest of us mortals, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, that, it's that same side, it's that coin with these two different sides. And, and, and everybody knows the triangle between what you can have. You can have it, you can have something fast, mm -hmm. you can have something good, good you and cheap. you can have cheap. You can have it cheap. You can have all three. You can, you can have two of those, uh, but you can have all three. And so that's why I said screw it and drew, drew the stuff myself because kick my own ass and you know, I love probably you gotta get up early and get this knocked out. When you're dealing with uh, you who have to deal with other uh, collaborators, you're at their mercy to a degree, especially if you can't pay what other people can pay and they're doing it partially for the love. And you know, if somebody says, look, I can't do it this week, 
you just got to deal with that. You know? um, as far as um, where my biggest struggles coming in that uh, with the independence, um, I, I've been a fan of podcasting since since its inception, and I started following um, a lot of creators. Uh, one of them was Scott Sick, who we've done panels with, and um, he did that because he could not get anybody to, to do his book to publish it. So he wrote this book, and then he did it in an audio book form, releasing it in chapters, basically. So what I started doing is I, I really got into the podcast and enjoyed all the shows. And I created myself into this, this character called, I call doesn't get it guy. I would call into all of these shows on 800 lines or whatever and say, hey, how come you guys never talk about this independent book or that independent book? Or, and they instantly picked up on the doesn't get it guy because they would, they would, I would say, I don't know what's going on with Marvel. I don't know what's going on with DC. What's going on with this? What's going on with that? And actually, that's how I came across your book. Watson and Holmes, because I brought up, has anybody read Brack Queens? I've never heard of them. Like, wow, that's pretty pretty amazing. So the trade-off was your book for Rack Queens. So I basically just try and, we're always trying to find those diamonds in the rough because I don't want to hear, I, I mean, yeah, I'll go buy them. I'm like, yeah, okay. you know, mm -hmm. people want to buy them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they need to support the independent. And it's it's been a, it, it's a struggle all the time trying to keep keep you guys in the, in the forefront yeah. of it. So, but that's another angle to go at. And, and, and yeah, nothing up here is, is trying to say uh, is a pity party. Nothing up here is a Which is going to lead right into my next question. What's the best part of all this? The best part. The best part, is, I think there are two things that are best. And that is turning out something that resonates with people and interacting with them once that is done and seeing that it has resonated. Um, I, one thing I love to see is, is when I work with someone that's put their time in and they put the pen or pencil to paper and they've written that story and they've actually completed it and they've gone through the troubleshooting of the story and they've completed it. And I love the fact that in what I do for living with digital printing on demand, I can print one copy or five copies and that's the thing I want people to understand. Just get that one done. Even if you got one yes. copy, you went, finish. To, you went to finish, finish. and you finish. got it done. All these guys up here, they didn't start out with what they have in front of them right now. They started out somewhere, and that's the trick, is to always get started. Just get it done. Get the first one done, whether it's a finish. web comic or it's not. Yeah, I mean, you know, a couple years ago, before I did the digital copy of Watson and Holmes, we did the New York Comic Con, we had some black and white ones that we released. Just like a limited number. That's what I downloaded from the, the app, the noir edition. That was really cool. And then I looked, I looked at the color and contrast, and it was almost like it brought a new dimension to the story. Because you're, you're just looking at Rick's pencils from that one. And they're unbelievable. That's some, and, yeah. Yeah. and most people don't realize that like, you're seeing Rick's stuff in the raw, and most people will never see that, and that's what those raw editions are for. Right. Yeah. It's so important. Um, not for this, it doesn't have to do with your questions, Jenny, but um, it's something that we talked about before <coughs> at the uh, world building panels and what we talked about in Sites to Indies and almost every panel you will run across. Finish, 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 finish. If you don't finish something, then you can't walk over to someone and show it to them. Uh, uh, some of you may know who Reggie Cutler is. <laughs> and those of you who don't, your ass should know who Reggie Cutler is. Uh, if you saw a uh, house party, then you saw Reggie Hudlin's work. If you saw from back in the day, if you saw Boomerang, you saw Reggie Hudlin's work. If you ever tuned in to BET, now, you ain't got only be black to watch BET. But if, if you did, you saw Reggie Hudlin's work. If you picked up Black Panther, buku stuff, you, then you know Reggie Hudlin's work. We were talking when he came by my table and because someone had stood up at a panel and talked about what she uh, had been inspired to do by the prior year's panel she was asked what have you done and she said well I've taken photographs of something and I plan to do this and I plan to do that as we were talking <clears throat> after the after that they had that interaction I said I noticed your body language, your body language changed and and he said, well, no, 
you noticed your own attitude change yeah. when you heard it because we both said at the same time, you don't have product. You said, you told us you had finished something. You haven't finished anything. You can't show me something to be critiqued if you haven't finished it. You can't ask me to sell it or promote it if you haven't finished it. I'm not going to promote your proposition. I will promote your product. And if you don't finish it, how can I do that? So finish. Don't say, oh, well, it's not quite as good as I want. None of our stuff is as good as we wanted it to be when we first did it. We learned from it, and we made the next one better. And then maybe the third one is like, oh, now I got it. I'm in my groove, and I'm kicking ass with it. Finish it. You won't be able to make those improvements until you finish it.